Okay, welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting, regular meeting number 12-2007, Monday, August 13th, 2007. Uh, we'll start with the roll call by the acting town clerk. Uh, Councillor McKinney? Here. Councillor Backer? Cynthia, Councillor Dill? Present. Uh, Councillor Lennon? Councillor Lynch? Here. Councillor Rowe? Here. Councillor swift Um Manager McGovern? Yep. Okay, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin with a review of the minutes of meeting number 11, held July 9th, 2007. I move adoption of the minutes. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor. Very good. Okay, reports and correspondence. Does anybody have anything? Jim, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul, you were uh, serving our country at, during the last meeting, uh, for which we thank you. And uh, we're not able to attend the uh, town council meeting, but I'd like to reiterate a comment that I made about what a joy it was to help elect you as president of the uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments in June. Uh, those of us who have worked closely with Paul know how uh, strong his interest in, is in uh, regionalization and uh, intercommunity cooperation. I think uh, you'll do just a wonderful job, and we wish you well during your tenure. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. And I had one other. Yes, go ahead. Uh, perhaps you, you or Mike will comment on this too, but I, I, it was also a joy to attend the uh, dedication of the Ray E. Moulton Field yesterday uh, at the middle school. Um, while uh, perhaps Joan Benoit Samuelson may claim uh, the honor of being the most famous Cape Elizabeth High School graduate, I don't think that there are any uh, stories that are any more inspirational or, or uh, remarkable than that of uh, Ray Moulton. And it was certainly a fitting tribute uh, and uh, greatly appreciated by a lifelong Cape Elizabeth resident. Would, would you care to, um, for the record, uh, share a little bit about that? Or would you like me to do so? You, you're more okay. Uh, yes, we had a dedication ceremony at the Ray E. Moulton Field, which is the athletic field uh, on Scott Dyer Road that abuts the middle school. It used to be the high school uh, baseball and soccer field for many years. Uh, Ray Moulton uh, was a uh, Cape Elizabeth High Schooler in the 1950s uh, who had lost his arm in childhood due to cancer, um, overcame that challenge, became a, a, a very good athlete at Cape Elizabeth High School, and uh, just would not give in to uh, the challenges that uh, he was dealt. Uh, went on to become a very successful businessman, and uh, I think one of the uh, more important lessons of Ray Moulton is that he taught us uh, not to forget your roots, where you came from. He, he really appreciated the, uh, the support that he got as a child growing up in Cape Elizabeth with his uh, disabilities and uh, wanted to do something in return. So he not only has sponsored uh, scholarships at the high school, but has given significant money uh, to improve some of our physical facilities at the school sites. But uh, great story. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, one other thing about Ray is he uh, donated $300,000 to establish a scholarship fund for student athletes. And every year, $15,000, basically a 5% interest from that fund, is given away to student athletes to attend higher education. Among the attendees at the ceremony were several of Ray's high school classmates. And it was, it was like watching a, a high school reunion right before your eyes. It was, it was quite moving. Thanks very much. Any other reports and correspondence? Okay. Town Manager's report. Just very briefly, want to thank everyone for all their assistance with the tenth running of the Beach to Beacon uh, TD Bank North Beach to Beacon Road race. Uh, we had 531 Cape Elizabeth runners finish the race, which I think is, is the most notable uh, fact amongst everything to do with the road race. But anyway, it was once again a success. I want to thank all the volunteers, the runners from Cape Elizabeth, and all the town staff and others who were involved in, in the race. So, yeah, as well as the help, the considerable help we get from surrounding communities as well, particularly Scarborough and uh, South Portland are both very helpful. Uh, 
with personnel on race day. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on any item that does not appear, appear on our agenda this evening? Okay. We'll move on to item number 122. And this is, um, well, it's the restaurant class 1, 2, 3, and 5 liquor license application for Rudy's of the Cape. Do you have a motion? Um, um, I'd like to move approval of the um, liquor license application for Rudy's of the Cape at 517 Ocean House Road. Okay. Do we have a second? Second the motion. Okay. Thank you. Michael. I just want to make a brief comment. Uh, this liquor license application, when it, when it comes to the town, it's endorsing it for the state to consider it. Uh, this does not constitute the full local approval of any change or potential change in use at this particular property. The change in the, in the use uh, would have to be approved through the, through the normal procedures if it switched from, you know, for example, from a retail type store to something else. Uh, an interesting part of this application as well is if the applicant moves forward with this liquor license, they would no longer have the ability to retail uh, beer and wine for taking out of the store. So, you know, for that reason, this, my, my guess is that, you know, as this issue evolves, there'll be more issues, there will be more issues uh, to come. But, you know, in the staff, in looking at this specific application, uh, we saw no reason uh, that it should not be approved. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Any discussion on the item? I apologize for the double negative. <laughs> <laughs> any, any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll move to item number 123, Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to suggest that Maureen O'Meara explain both 123 and 124 together, particularly when I put the agenda together, I didn't exactly describe 124 correctly. I misread uh, some of the paperwork, so I'd like Maureen to explain both. It's okay with you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, the State of Maine, Maine Department of Environmental Protection, has adopted new stormwater rules, and they're filtering through, no pun intended. Um, and one of the rules that's coming up is they are requiring that um, if you are developing in an urban impaired watershed, that you need to either, you, you need to basically go into the watershed, find a project that needs to be done, and mitigate the impact of your project and you need to work with a private property owner to do that. Or a town can adopt a community fee utilization plan where they identify the projects, they collect the fee, they put it into a fund, and when you have enough money, the town goes forward, picks a project out of the plan, and they use the money to improve the watershed. It's an advantage for developers because they don't need to go looking for a project. Um, it's an advantage for a town because you have a lot more input into how you want to see uh, those kinds of projects done instead of leaving it up to a developer to try to find something. The problem with Cape Elizabeth is Troutbrook has been designated an urban impaired watershed and hopefully you have the colored maps in your package because the black and white ones just don't show anything. But um, Troutbrook runs in through this area. Um, as you can see, Troutbrook covers um, a lot of orange zoned area, which is our RC district, and some of the gold, which is our RB district. The RC and the RB are the places where we say that we want the growth in the town to occur. And when you now say you're, you're in an urban impaired watershed and you need to pay a fee, it can work as a disincentive to push development out of that area into other areas of the town. So what you have before you tonight are two separate proposals. One is within the watershed of Trout Brook to approve submission to the DEP of a plan where you collect the fee and you spend the money to do improvements in the watershed. And what I've done is I've drafted up a plan that is 
almost verbatim modeled after the plan that the city of South Portland has done for the Long Creek watershed. So the structure is pretty much the same. The projects I've pulled out of the literature that's available, most specifically chapter four of the urban streams report that's been prepared by the DEP. Uh, one of the advantages of having trout brook um, is that there's already a lot of data on it. There's a lot of studies that have been done on habitat. The one downside is, except for one spot right here, there has been no data collected in the town of Cape Elizabeth for what the status of Trout Brook is. So I've put together a list of projects. I have submitted them in draft to the DEP. I haven't heard from them yet. I have also been working with the city of South Portland, their, their water resources director, their, their land trust, their planning director, and they've seen these projects and no one is having a heart attack over them yet. Um, and most of them are going to cost some money and we're not expecting that we would have the money anytime soon to do any of those projects. But just to go over briefly what's proposed, and again, I, you know, I would like to talk to the DEP and find out what they would find to be acceptable for a project. But from our perspective, what's been recommended is, one, to actually do more data collection. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that in the Trout Brook watershed, I mean, on this part, almost, ex almost completely developed with very tight neighborhoods in South Portland. Mm -hmm. In the Cape Elizabeth part, definitely we have some tight neighborhoods, but we also have a lot of undeveloped land. And it would be nice to actually have some data that's specific to Cape Elizabeth so we know how much of a problem we have. We might even be able to collect enough data to show that Cape Elizabeth is really meeting the water quality classification and then it wouldn't be an impaired watershed anymore. But that's down the road once we do tests and get through a whole bunch of things. Um, and then the other, the other report, the other uh, projects really focus a lot more on doing things that are within the right-of-way that there are public rights because there hasn't been a lot of work done with any neighbors on this and I need to make that very clear. Um, riparian buffer restoration, basically there are places, um, State Ave and a lot of them in South Portland where you know proud homeowners have, have extended their lawn right to the edge of the brook mm -hmm. and in fact leaving a natural buffer tends to improve the water quality so that is basically number two is is trying to do an education effort and where, where property owners are willing, also provide them with plantings and some volunteers to go in and establish that, reestablish that buffer. The stormwater outfall erosion control are four locations identified in the urban streams report where they've said we could be using better management practices to control the stormwater. That one very much is a heavily engineered kind of technique. The assumption is we would do what needed to be done within the right-of-way. If it, we couldn't do it within the right-of-way, then obviously we'd have to start working with property owners to see if we could get some easements. Uh, number four, sinuosity restoration, is a section of Trout Brook in South Portland that apparently in the past has had lots of flows and it's a straight shot. And things have happened over time and the flows have been controlled and it's starting to wind its way back and winding grinding um, streams tend to have better water quality because there's more opportunity for um, treatment and also they're having less erosion. And what the urban streams report recommended is we could actually go in there and start doing some plantings along the winding way to kind of help it restore its sinuosity. And then f number five is um, the town of Cape Elizabeth and the city of South Portland already do a lot of street sweeping but they don't use this special vacuum sweeper which is supposed to be able to pick up the fines and the fines are the ones that have most of the pollutants stuck to them so potentially the town would look at purchasing a sweeper perhaps in conjunction with South Portland but again none of this work would be done until there was actually enough money in the fund to consider a project and then you know there is still an opportunity at that point to say well maybe we want to amend the plan working with DEP and make some adjustments to it. And then the final one is more of this road stormwater uh, runoff treatment where, again, you'd be looking heavy-duty engineering um, unless you could plant some buffers and work with private property owners. So that's the Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan piece. And the short answer to that is what it does is it makes it easier for developers to just pay a fee to the town 
as opposed to looking for a project that's the equivalent of the fee they would have to pay anyway. And that deals with at least trying to take some of the administrative burden of this off of, off of the table. But what it still leaves on the table is that this is still pushing some projects out of the areas we've said we want to have growth occur. So the second piece is, we, go right ahead. Can I ask a couple of questions about sure. the first piece? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you said that there was, under the DEP scheme, there was these two um, options. One would be for the developer to partner with a private landowner and do a project to mitigate. Um, do you know if there's a lot of potential projects out there? I know of one in particular. Okay. That's, that's, it's in the pipeline now. It's coming in very soon. Okay. And could a developer who is developing property in Cape Elizabeth choose to mitigate or, or team up and do a project in South Portland? Yes, it could. Oh, okay. And how do they define the boundary of a watershed? Um, it's mostly based on topography. I mean, you, you go to the ridges and where the water runs in this direction and drains into the trout brook, that's the watershed. Oh, okay. Where, I mean, this is probably a relatively high point and the water from this point doesn't run into Trout Brook, it runs in a different direction. Okay. So that's how watersheds are defined. Okay. And then my last question mm -hmm. is, um, given, I think you probably know better than anyone, the, the sort of the range of development projects and costs, what would be the range of these fees that we're talking about that would you be know, added onto a project? I'll tell you, I've, I've worked with the town engineer who does a lot of work with the DEP with a lot of projects, and, and he says, you know, we work with staff at DEP very closely to figure out what fee amounts are because it's really complicated. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing on the fee, that, on the project that I know that's coming in is roughly fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. but no one has sat down and calculated it yet, and so I don't want you to rely on it, and I wouldn't be calculating it. I mean, Is that a residential development? Yes, it's a residential development, and it's really based on how much new impervious surface you are creating. And so you can see, in South Portland, you're doing a lot of redevelopment. So it's already paved, and you can actually get credit for impervious surface that is already there. Whereas in Cape Elizabeth, where it's mostly undeveloped, any new project is going to have a relatively high impervious surface ratio. Okay, thank you. Okay. I just had a question on the uh, restoring the sinuosity. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned, just mentioned using vegetation to accomplish that. Yeah. Uh, I see in the diagram here there are two uh, low curb walls and double wing deflectors. Yes. What are those made out of? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, and, and you can see that I relied heavily on, I didn't even try to plagiarize, I quoted directly from the Urban Streams report. And I just, that particular project struck me as a unique opportunity to do something different. But, you know, we would have to work with the abutters to that stream and see if they were willing to do that. And that's why on the list, it's, it, it's not first or second on the list, it's down low and, you know. I don't know if you'd ever get to it. Marianne? Um, Maureen, a couple questions. You said that on a project that you think may be coming in, mm -hmm. you think the fee may be fifteen or 20000 Do you know what size project you're looking Approximately at? Approximately 45 to 46 condominium units. Okay. And um, presumably that fee, whatever it is, will mm. be passed on to new homeowners? Usually any, any cost that a developer spends ends up going into okay. the project, yeah. So is it conceivable that new homeowners would end up paying for the riparian buffer for existing homeowners who Absolutely down true. to the water? Yes. Okay. And another question I have is, on the street sweeper, mm -hmm. are we planning to, maybe I should direct this to the town manager, use it only in that neighborhood, or would we be planning to use it in the entire town? If, if that's what came to pass, we would use it in the entire town. Thank you. And there are, there, the public works director has expressed some concerns with maintenance of that type of sweeper too. So again, it's, it's far down on the list. And my expectation would be that if enough money ended up in this account, that at that point the town may want to take a closer look at this plan and refine it. Okay. 
one last question. So um, just to follow up on Marianne's question about the um, sort of passing on the potential fee to the homeowner, um, is there any different, would, would not having the fee and just having the landowner and the developer work out a project to meet the requirements of DEP be less costly, do you think? Or it's no, supposed to be I, the same? I, I, would, I challenge you to find a developer who would be willing to try to find a project instead of just write the check. It's a lot easier and they, they much prefer being, a, I mean, as the applicant, the town has on occasion tried to find some area to mitigate and um, we've done a really good job of protecting wetlands and not having a lot of erosion problems. It's really hard to find something that's in bad shape and try to go and fix it. Plus, you know, if you think of trying to find it, mm. you've got to work with a property owner, you've got to design a solution, you've got to go in and construct it. There's a lot of ifs and risks there versus just saying, here's the money. Thank you. Maureen, is this a, um, I, after I, when I read this through, I was pretty surprised about the total potential cost of mitigation. And, I, and it, what occurred to me was um, the question, it, is this a, a new development with the DEP to go to urban areas that have been well developed? It's actually, it's a, it's, a, yeah, it's a federal, it started at the federal level and it's gotten handed down to the state and they are being required to take any urban stream that's not meeting its water quality classification to designate it an urban impaired watershed. And if, if you have any project that needs a DEP permit, you have to comply with the urban stream standards. Okay, and when you say meets the water quality standards, is that based on tests that they've done? Yes. In this particular area? Okay. Right, right. So, so, so there's certain runoff that's apparently going into the stream that's degrading, it's degrading the water quality. Yes, but like I said, the only good test I found was right here. And, you know, I, I'd like to see more tests because the, the, the place where they, they did the testing is right on the Cape South Portland line oh. and not that far up from it is an outfall coming out of South Portland and okay. I'm not convinced based on that I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing what is environmentally sound anyway right. oh well, clearly yeah maybe there are other reasons and you could prevent whatever the the runoff is and mitigate it that way instead of trying to create a whole new yes environment Marianne is this a time sensitive issue? Yes. How time there, sensitive? There's a developer who's, in my, the last conversation I had with him, he will be submitting next month. My concern is, I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect other counselors do. Uh, I would be interested in having a public hearing, and it may well be that nobody shows up. Everyone thinks it's a great idea and we should go forward with it. But it strikes me that we're putting a fairly sub substantive as well as substantial impact fee through, which does distort the cost of new homes versus existing homes. Mm -hmm. And again, it may well be that we, in the end, think that we should do that. But I, for one, would feel better if we had a public hearing on it next month because the public has had no notice of this other than it was in our package last week so and, and just to respond to your question it is time sensitive but i mean my assumption is that the, t the council has at least two or three months to play around with this and not create any problems anywhere else Can I ask one more question? Uh, sorry thank you um so let's just assume that um we're able through whatever means to collect additional data and it shows that all of the water in Cape Elizabeth's section of Trout Brook it meets all the standards. I mean, that doesn't necessarily change the boundary of the watershed. So how Well, that and I haven't explored with the DEP what the procedure would be at that point. Certainly if we had the data in hand, I would then be aggressively pursuing that. Right. Um, but I would, th I would think that if we could show that the water quality in Cape Elizabeth is meeting the Class B standards. That we should at least have a conversation and see if we can adjust the, you know, the designation. But I really would have to, you know, I need to start from somewhere, and they need to call me back 
so I can ask that question. Would changing the designation be at the state level or at the federal level? Um, I don't know. That's a good. That's another good question. Thanks, Michael. I just Maureen's referenced a couple of times a pending development, and it's no secret. Uh, it, it's on the Gladys, Gladys Sullivan property, former Gladys Sullivan property on East Monroe, Joel Fitz. Patrick has met with us a number of times about a potential development of that property. He's also come to the council at one point to discuss uh, whether or not be, that would be, be within the sewer service area. In addition to that, currently on the market is the Huss Barn on the corner of Spurwink Avenue and Route 77. Uh, that also includes the land between the Huss Barn and the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Uh, so for you know that reason that development while there's no proposed development scheme there yet that property is being marketed uh, for its development potential if one looks at the ad online for that particular land so there, there, are, there is activity within this watershed area that that does uh, indicate that it'd be good for the council to deal with this in the shorter term but as Maureen says it doesn't need to be done tonight thanks <clears throat> well um I don't have any can objection I, to Marianne's can I make suggestion. A motion? Yes, please. I would move that we um, set this for public hearing for the September, September council 10th. meeting. September 10th, council meeting. I second. Okay. Any discussion? My only point of discussion is that after we discuss item 124, I wonder if we'd want to have a public hearing on. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, but we separate need to motion. have separate motions or have a motion to take them together, so we might as well have separate motions. All right, we already have the motion on the floor. Any other discussion? All in favor of taking item 123, the Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan and putting it to public hearing on September 20, uh, 10th. Okay. Next item is item number 124, Trout Brook Watershed Stormwater Improvement Fee. We have a motion on that. And I would move that we set this item for public hearing for September 10th. Can Second. I call it Trout Brook. Any discussion? Just to clarify, this is an improvement fee yeah. for, the, for, the for the entire town. town. That's right. Okay. I read the Getting thing the wrong, wrong. way. Yeah. All right, so you want to make any amendment or you? Well, I so The minutes will reflect the correct. Okay. okay and very good. Jim. Uh, I believe Maureen was going to start mm. with her narrative about this issue. Oh. Right. And I can or I can sit down. It's fine. No, I like that. <laughs> Go ahead, Maureen. Um, okay. So um, the Trope Brook is, is being driven by state mandates. The stormwater improvement fee is completely voluntary. You don't have to do it. So why would you want to? Um, the town, and you know, you've all been through the comprehensive plan workshops, the town has been very successful in directing and, and having growth happen where it says it wants to happen. And I think one of the reasons you've been successful is you've been working for years to get all your policies moving in the same direction. You've got your sewer policies working in the same direction and your, your road standards working in the direction. Um, all your zoning is, is pushing into certain directions. Once you designate this right here, once it was designated, this is now starting to push some development out of these areas that were designated as, as good areas for growth. And one way to reestablish that equilibrium is to make the fee that's going to apply to this area apply to everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be that any project that would trigger the fee if it was here would also trigger the fee if it was here. And that money, it would be an independent local fee. And what you could do with that money is just take it, put it in a designated stormwater improvement account, and use it for stormwater improvements. And the limitation on it would be how you decide to spend it. Uh, the major advantage of doing that is it reestablishes the balance between the growth areas and the non-growth areas. Thank you for the input. I, I think that's excellent clarification you don't want to incent the wrong things is you know basically the the, right. the wrong action okay very good um, all in favor of the motion as stated that we're going to put this to public hearing. Okay. very good 
Okay, we'll move on to item number 125, Cape Elizabeth Alternative Energy Committee. Someone like to make a motion? Jim. I would move that uh, we establish a Cape Elizabeth Alternate, uh, Alternative Engine, Energy Committee uh, which will explore opportunities to provide alternative energy to municipal school buildings and vehicles. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. Well, I would just like to say that I'm really excited about um, this initiative, and um, I'm really looking forward to exploring some of these ideas. I've had so many people, including my husband, say that he really would like to have a small wind turbine. <laughs> and so we'll see <laughs> what happens. But. I, I second that. I, I think this is really exciting. It's one of our council goals this year, and it's really a, it's a good thing because uh, I think it's important for every, every municipality to, you know, press forward, even if the state or the federal government isn't doing something. And I know they are doing certain things, but it's important that we show some local leadership and uh, you know, work together. And one of the initiatives at Greater Portland Council of Governments is to help do this on a, on a regional basis in a collaborative manner. So I think this is a great thing that we're doing in Cape Elizabeth. Okay, all in favor? Excellent. Okay, we'll move on to item number 126, energy efficient technology. So we have a motion. Cynthia? I would move that we uh, request the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to review our code of ordinances to recommend appropriate language to implement opportunities for green energy efficient technology. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, all in favor? Yeah. Item number 127, appointments to standing boards and commissions policy. Is there a motion? Oh. Marianne. Uh, I would move that we um, refer to the appointments committee for review the um, question of whether part-time employees should be able to, part-time municipal employees should be able to serve as long, um, on town boards or commissions as long as they are appointed to serve in a capacity that's unrelated to their work. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Cynthia? Any discussion? And I just speak to this. This actually came from the appointments committee because um, we wanted to appoint um, one of the election workers mm -hmm. who works one or two days a year to a town board. And so it was just a little gray area that we, well, it wasn't so great, so that's why we want to look at it so huh. that we can do it. Excellent. All right, all in favor? Very good. Item number 128, sign ordinance. Jim. I would move that we charge the uh, ordinance committee with conducting a comprehensive review of the sign ordinance. Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, all in favor. Oh, wait a minute. Jim? I just wanted to ask, uh, who is the staff uh, assignment? Mike. Oh. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, any other discussion? I just wanted to say, I, I think it's high time that we do this. Um, it's been interesting to me, the proliferation of signs, mm -hmm. particularly before Beach to Beacon. Uh -huh. And um, many of the signs seem to be not in compliance with our own ordinance. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're in, in compliance with the state billboard law. Um, there was a local bank that had a big sign out off premises uh, during the Beach to Beacon. And so I, I think it is time that we look at that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, all in favor? Excellent. Okay, item number 129, Capital Improvement Plan 2008 to 2017. Maybe you'd like to speak to this, Michael? Just briefly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the Capital Improvement Plan uh, goes out for about 10 years, and this is almost as much a debt management plan as it is a, a capital improvement plan. It proposes that we 
that we not have the amount of bonded indebtedness increase above essentially the current level, and that we, we try to plan the more major projects at intervals when the debt goes down so that the amount that you would borrow would not exceed the, going back to the current level that it now is. And what that does is provides for about a $7 million bond issue in fiscal year 2010 and an $8 million bond issue in fiscal year 2014, with about half divided between the schools and the other half of the municipal needs. And it, and it gives a list of potential needs at that point, but leaves it to the future to determine where the priorities uh, are within those areas as we become closer. For example, in 2010, such things as the, as the off-road path on Shore Road, a possible expansion of the library, some fire equipment, uh, Mitchell Road improvements, uh, the land trust suggestions to contribute, to borrow money to put in land acquisition priorities. All these things that are sort of identified in the comprehensive plan are laid out here, but it's proposed to be done in such a way that it be done in a way that, that properly uh, manages debt and gives an opportunity for a lot of public input and advanced planning of uh, community priorities. The, the requested action is simply to acknowledge the receipt of it. Okay. We need a motion. That's what I was going to do. Cynthia. I move that <laughs> we you. I move that we acknowledge receipt of the capital improvement plan for 2008 through 2017. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Super. Thanks, Michael, for putting that together. It's uh, definitely going to be helpful in the future. All in favor? All right. Item number 130, MMA ballot. Mm -hmm. We have a motion. Um, I would move that we uh, authorize um, the council to cast the Maine Municipal Association ballot for the nominated candidates. And um, it's a particular pleasure to note that um, our colleague, uh, Ann Swift Chaota, is now president elect of MMA and um, will become president on January 1, 2008. And um, the ballot itself would be to nominate, um, I'm looking for his name, but he's the vice. I can't put his name, Galen Knox. Galen Knox from the town of Knox um, as the new vice president. Did I get the right name? No, Galen Larrabee. Oh. Oh, <laughs> no, excuse me. Sorry. I, I didn't know. Okay. I, the ballot's in the packet there, so. Okay. okay, I'll just move the ballot as it's <laughs> set out in the packet. <laughs> but I did want to note Anne's um, presidency of Maine Municipal Association. She's worked very hard for a number of years in that organization, and uh, it's clear that they recognize her, her immense talents. Do we have a second? Second the motion. Any discussion? I, yes. Just briefly, um, there, on the ballot that I have in my pocket, packet, it says over. Yeah, there's yeah, nothing on the, is there anything on no. the back? That we need? It's the signature page. Oh, okay. And why is uh, Anne, no one's running against her, but why doesn't her name appear on the ballot? She's already been elected. She's, she's already the president-elect. She's already been elected. She'll so. automatically become. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. She was elected a year ago. I would just uh, like to add to uh, Mary Ann's comments that we're very proud of Ann and we know how capable she is, having uh, served with her on the council. Very, very smart lady and uh, she does a great job with MMA and she'll do even more as the president, I'm sure. So, just, it, yes. There, there was an invitation Deborah Lane mailed out today to, I think it's Thursday, October 3rd and I forget the right date, whatever the email said in Augusta where they, they have, she has a few words and it's, it's a nice event to go to if any of you are available. If you could let Deborah know you're available in the next uh, week or so, that'd be great. Okay, Thanks. All in favor? Okay. And now we move to item, um, citizens discussion no, of items. No. Oh, one other thing? New no. item. Oh, oh, I didn't? Yeah. I'm using my packet that was yeah. mailed to me, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Item number 131, MDOT Agreement for Spurwing Avenue Project. Yes, this is very important. Uh, do we have a motion? Jim. I'd move that we authorize the town manager to sign the city-state city agreement with MDOT for the Spurwing Avenue Paving Project. Second. Okay, any discussion? 
So we expect this project to be within budget. We're optimistic. I would just like to say one thing that uh, I would uh, like to commend Michael for his work with um, PACS and with MDOT to make this happen. I, I know it was an uphill battle, and you did a great job, Michael. It ain't done yet. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be done when the payment's on, but, but you did a great job organizing it anyway. So with that, all Bob in favor? Bob Malley's worked a lot on this, too. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And now we go to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Okay. And then adjournment. Who would like to make a motion for adjournment? How about we adjourn? Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. All right. Could be a record. Not quite a record, but we're close. Close to a record. <laughs>